Hello, everybody. Welcome to tonight's session on uh, maintenance. As everybody knows, right, um, I often get people coming and telling me, and I'm sure Anthony hears this a lot, right? Uh, oh, I put in a native garden because somebody told me there's no maintenance involved. Uh, that's a lie. <laughs> no, to put it plainly, any garden, right? Any garden means intention. That means you intend for certain plants to be in certain places. Um, you can be loose with your control, but still uh, you don't intend to plant uh, you know, an oak tree or a maple tree to grow where you have um, your, let's say garden bed, flower bed or pollinator garden. So definitely there is maintenance involved and um, you know, it is less than, or it's different from what you do with a traditional garden. And what I want to do is uh, have Anthony Marinello, uh, who needs no introduction to this community because he's really established a huge name for himself on Long Island as somebody who knows his native plants, very open and eager with a lot of advice and guidance. Uh, he definitely has been, you know, uh, a, a leading light in terms of the social media. So he, uh, the Facebook group on uh, native plant gardening, I think, I don't know what it is. Is it about 10,000 people now? And me, I mean, somewhere between eight. Seven, 7.2 thousand, I think. Okay, good. So yeah, so there's Almost so that's like. a huge, so don't feel alone. Uh, don't feel like you're that lone and eccentric doing the gardening and uh, definitely getting on to the maintenance schedule and learning maintenance and doing uh, things correctly really matters. Uh, just a quick, quick note before I hand over to Anthony, if you have any questions, please put that in chat. Um, we'll go back at the end of the presentation and then go back and answer questions in order. All right, thank you. With that, hand it over to Anthony. Okay. You need to enable my screen sharing. Just it. Okay, perfect. And here we go. Uh, so thank you again, Raju, for having me. Thank you everyone for joining us. We are going to talk about native plant garden maintenance, some methods and techniques for success. So as you are probably well aware, there are a lot of problems with traditional turf lawns, and this is where the low maintenance or no maintenance comparison comes in. Um, you know, we're, we're, when we say it's low maintenance, we're really talking about native plant gardens being low maintenance in comparison to weekly maintenance. That is what most people are experiencing with a lawn. Um, so as you can see, there are plenty of reasons why you should not want to be growing a lawn anymore and why um, you could switch over to native plants, as many of you most likely have, considering you're joining us for how to maintain your gardens. Um, and this is what we are preventing when we plant out native gardens and when we maintain them in the way that requires. So the truth about maintenance, as Roger said, no maintenance is a lie. Low maintenance is more in tune with what native plant gardening is about. There is still maintenance because as we just discussed, gardens need to be maintained. If you don't maintain your garden, you will end up eventually with a whole mess of weeds and brambles and shrubbery growing. Um, you know, any abandoned lot that you might have in your you know, your own community is pretty much what your yard will become if you just don't maintain it. Um, so a common misconception is the native plants are no maintenance. Uh, every garden needs to be maintained. I recommend monthly to seasonal maintenance. Um, so, you know, once a month you can go out there, you can weed your garden, just see if anything needs to be done. Uh, eventually with time, you'll be required less and less maintenance. The main thing is to familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with common invasive weeds that may volunteer as well as native species. So a lot of people, focus on the you know the weedy plants that might pop up especially the invasive ones which is definitely what you want to do but you also want to familiarize yourself with seedlings of native species that you're growing but also that might just you know pop up on their own or blow in or be brought in by wildlife those are free plants at that point if they're in a, an acceptable place in your garden or if you're able to move them i always suggest you do so and take advantage of what nature is providing so the benefits of converting to a native garden you know, requires less inputs. So native plants have evolved to withstand the harsh growing conditions that nature's created. They don't require fertilizer, pesticides, or supplemental irrigation once they're established. Weekly maintenance is replaced by monthly or seasonal maintenance. That saves you money long-term because you're not spending the money on the inputs every week and you're not spending the money on the mowing every week, the mowing and blowing. Keeps those toxic chemicals out of our environment so they never become a problem and Native gardens also help reduce pollutants by filtering them out of our stormwater. 
So I like to say that maintenance starts with smart design. Uh, plant selection is really what's key. You really wanna know how your plant both grows individually, but also how it reproduces. Some plants you know, are aggressive spreaders, whether it's vegetatively or seeding out. So you really want to know your plants. You also wanna plant densely when you're planting out your, your gardens. You know, 12 to 24 inches on center, closer to 12 is better, especially if you're planting out smaller size uh, plants. And you wanna fill all the niches that are in your garden. So amongst the, even the smallest ground covers you have, there's still that niche of what could grow beneath that. So instead of, you know, piling on the wood mulch, which is typical of a regular garden, you know, a conventional garden, you would be planting out violets or allowing the violets to spread on their own and fill in the spaces, or you'd plant out sedges or other low growing vegetation that'll fill in the spaces in between your taller plants and prevent weeds from taking hold. Um, some ease of access as well. It always helps to include paths, buffer zones, and access points so that you can actually get into your garden. That was something I actually learned myself the hard way when I first started this years ago. Um, I realized that it was very difficult for me to actually get in there and do what I needed to do. So I ended up putting pathways all throughout the garden so that you can just walk in as you please. You can take a nice stroll through the garden. And if you really need to, you can get in there and get dirty, pull any weeds you need to, or transplant things, or add some more plants in if I need to. So again, plant selection is key. Growth and reproduction is what's important. Some native species are just too aggressive for you know suburban gardeners like many of us are. So giant goldenrod and common milkweed, they need a lot of room to roam. Those are two good examples of plants you want to avoid if you are in the suburbs. I um, am very familiar with clients who call me up and I come to their home and they have common milkweed you know, escaped their garden. It's in either their lawn or it's growing through the cracks in the, in the pavers in their patio or it's flopping over onto a pathway. Certain plants just don't belong in the home garden um, unless you have the space for them. So rhizomatis and stoloniferous species, really you wanna use those sparringly or you wanna use them wisely. Heavy cedars can also be a problem in the home garden. Um, excessive volunteers really can be overwhelming for an individual to manage, especially by themselves. Um, and some of them can actually outcompete your other native plants that you planned for in the garden. So one species that is a, you know, in my garden, that's a heavy cedar. It's one that I didn't plant. It was volunteered white snake root. Um, it's actually just starting to bloom. I love it because this time of year it really brings a lot of pollinators and the songbirds really like to eat it. Um, some people, if you had a lot of empty spaces, it can be kind of jarring about how quickly that it can take over and fill in and colonize those spaces. I don't mind it. In my eyes, that's nature telling me I missed a spot and that's nature filling it in for me. So if it ends up popping up somewhere where it might get too tall on the front border or next to a pathway, I remove it, replace it with something else. But if it fills in you know, somewhere where it fits, I don't mind it at all. These aggressive plants are really best for large areas or if you have a hillside or something that needs erosion control or freshly um, cleared areas that used to have invasive species that you just cleared out and now you wanna replant so that you don't have that recolonization occurring. Um, a good saying to remember is the right plant for the right place. You want to select the proper plants for your growing conditions, whatever your soil type is, your moisture, your sunlight, if you have wind, if, if salt spray, if you're on the beach or the shore. Um, and you also want to select plants that won't grow out your space. A lot of times people will plant out a shrub or even a large growing perennial, like, you know, Joe Pye weed, for example, thinking they can manage it and it gets way too large for the space. It's growing to their pathway in a couple of years, blocking entrance to their house scratching their car doors when they're pulling into the driveway. So you, you want to plan that right. And, you know, as with any garden, the right plant for the right place is, is important. You want to start off right. Again, you want to plant densely 12 to 24 inches apart. That'll save you a lot of trouble later with weeding because you've already colonized those spaces. The more space you leave open in between your plants, the more nature is going to fill that space. Nature abhors a vacuum. I'm sure many of you have heard that before. So if you leave an empty space open, nature is eventually going to fill it more than likely she's going to fill it with a non-native species if you're lucky she'll fill it with a native species um, so it just always helps to for us to make the decision for her and choose the proper native species that we want in our own gardens and again you want to simulate nature you want to allow these plants to grow as they would in nature forming large drifts or mosaics little to no open space in between them your plants are going to be their own mulch uh, you want to let them grow as their own live mulch that will protect the soil from erosion and compaction, moisture loss, heat, but it also will shade out weed seeds so that they cannot sprout and then you won't have them as a problem and that'll save you maintenance later on. 
If you're starting a garden, I always recommend mulch. Um, I'll speak more about where mulch comes from later on as the garden matures. But when you're first starting, it helps us uh, to, to apply some mulch. I prefer to use straw. Um, bales of straw are readily available. I actually also can source straw bales for people if you're looking for a straw. Um, it, it breaks down a lot quicker. It's more, um, it's, it's more what nature really would provide, especially in our grassland plantings that Long Island is very, um, you know, famous for where we have, you know, the Hempstead Plains, we have the Pine Barrens, we don't want to be enriching the soil with all that wood mulch. So straw mulch is definitely a better option. Leaf mulch is also okay. And then again, if you have dried shredded leaves or stalks, you can always mix those in and, and put that on top too. But if you're starting a bed, I always recommend straw. When you should disturb all those, so all the soil, all those dormant seeds are going to sprout. So it always helps to just mulch it when you first start. Irrigation. This is the number one reason people have problems with weeds. Um, we've already mentioned that most native plants, especially if you planted them in the right spot, don't require irrigation past their, past their establishment period. So usually after that first year of growing, they really don't need you to be watering them anymore. And even during that first year of growing, watering them correctly is what's important. Because if you're watering too frequently, you're going to have weeds growing all the time. Um, I recently had a client where that was the problem. They were watering every day. And the recommendation is to water once a week for at least an hour. You can water for more than an hour, but what you wanna do is water infrequently, but deeply. That way that the surface of the soil stays pretty dry, but the depth, the deep parts of the soil, it stays nice and moist. That trains your roots to grow deep, follow the moisture and prevents wheat seeds from germinating. So you want to abstain from fall cleanups. Fall is on its way. Today's the first day of September. Um, I can hear the leaf blowers already. Uh, don't cut back your plants in the fall. You want to leave them standing. That provides seeds for the songbirds and also overwintering sites and shelter for beneficial insects. Um, besides the pollinators that nest in our stems, also all of the little beneficial uh, arthropods like spiders and other you know, creepy crawlies that are very beneficial. So you wanna leave that all in place. You wanna to try to keep the leaf litter and other debris where it falls as well. If it's on your pathways, your driveway, collect it up, relocate it to your beds. That'll be your mulch for next year. Don't shred up your leaves. We'll talk about that a little as well. It used to be the recommendation to shred up your leaves. Um, if you have no choice and you're running out of room, then you can shred your leaves. I'm not gonna you know, harp on anybody for that. But when you shred the leaves, they decompose too quickly in the spring. And that's what we're gonna talk about in a little bit. I'll explain why that's not a good, a good thing to happen. Um, you wanna abstain from your spring cleanups too. So you don't wanna be cutting back your plants as soon as spring comes. You don't wanna be bagging up your mulch, you know, all your, your leaf mulch and, and throwing it in the garbage or putting it out in yard waste day. Uh, you wanna leave everything where it is. Late April, you wanna cut back your perennials 18 to 24 inches to provide habitat for our native stem nesting bees. Um, that, those cuttings you can actually leave. You can actually chop them up into smaller pieces, break them up with your hands, leave them right on the soil where they fall. And that will be another layer of mulch produced in the springtime. So now you have leaf mulch being deposited in the fall and your plants themselves becoming mulch in the spring. So then you'll have to buy mulch and you can save money. You can recycle nutrients and prevent weeds all at the same time. Growing season maintenance, anything that's tall, anything that blooms in late summer, which happens to be tall most of the time, and anything that's fall blooming. Uh, these things should be cut back by two thirds, uh, at least once a growing season. Sometimes I even cut things back twice a growing season. Um, around late June, early July, don't, you know, generally I wouldn't go past like mid July cutting back fall bloomers. That prevents flopping. It helps everything stay nice and short and compact. It'll be more bushy and less leggy and lengthy that will make your garden look nicer. It won't be floppy. You'll have less lodging. Um, and that'll just avoid the whole flopping situation that so many people have, especially when it rains or when your plants actually start to bloom when the weight of the flowers actually weigh them down. Another important thing, especially with native plant gardens, is to pay special attention to your borders and boundaries. This is what's really going to show people that you're maintaining a garden and you haven't like just let your property go. Um, that's the number one thing. Having clean borders really is what shows people in the community that you're maintaining the space. You have a delineation between your garden and maybe your lawn or the sidewalk. 
it just adds formality to the space, even if you're doing a naturalistic planting. Selective weeding, you know, like I said, select, uh, you can go out once a month, you can go out, you know, at your leisure, you know, even if you go out and just take a stroll through your garden every day and you bend down and happen to, you know, pull a couple plants out every time you walk through the garden, that's all that's really required uh, during the growing season. Um, I replanted out my front lawn with some native grasses and sedges last fall. I weeded it three times this, this growing season. Um, and I think I'm pretty much done now for the season. We're, you know, nothing really should be germinating that I need to worry about at this point. Um, so, you know, just like that, you can just go through leisurely and just selective weed through the summer months and, and handle them that way. Don't let your weeds go to seed. That's the number one important thing. You can cut the seed heads off the weeds, um, especially crabgrass. You don't wanna let these things go to seed. If you do, those seeds are just gonna build up in the seed bank in the soil and you will be stuck in the same cycle year after year unless you, know, you, you make the effort to remove those weed seeds or cover your soil and keep it covered. Winter pruning of woodies. Um, a lot of woody stuff like sh uh, shrubs and trees, that stuff really should be pruned. I like to do it late winter when the moisture in the air is at its lowest and when fungal spores are at their lowest, you don't wanna do it in the spring, you don't wanna do it in the fall. It's not good to do it during the summer either. Um, I like to just keep keep it going for the winter months. Um, you can go in, it's a lot easier. There's no leaves in your way. You can see what you're doing and prune your woodies that way. So this is why you don't wanna be shredding your leaves. You wanna leave the leaves whole. Um, this is a little something from the Xerxes Society. We have this red banded hair streak butterfly in New York on Long Island. Um, they use oak leaves. They lay their eggs in the, in the fall, the eggs over winter, and then come spring, they hatch and the caterpillar consumes the dead oak leaf. So now you have an oak leaf that has been separated from the tree for months and months and months, but it's still providing a food source for caterpillars come springtime. If you shred those leaves, they'll break down more quickly and the caterpillars won't have food. So you wanna try your best to leave everything whole. Find beauty in nature. Um, I know a lot of people getting involved with native plants. They have a pretty good idea of what they're looking at. Um, you know, most people don't go looking at, don't go starting something like this unless they've seen other native gardens already growing. Um, they tend to be more naturalistic looking. A successful native garden that is low maintenance tends to be more naturalistic looking. So if you aren't, familiar with that look and you haven't learned to appreciate that look, I definitely suggest you do that. Um, and you'll understand that it's not always gonna be just so crisp and clean. Plants aren't gonna be separated by two feet of mulch. Um, you know, it's gonna look a little bit wild at times and it's gonna change to the season. So it might look neat and trim in the springtime, but by late summer, fall, you know, there's fireworks going off in every corner. Um, and that's something you just have to, you know, appreciate that's what we're doing here. Um, changes through the seasons, nothing static. It's not a, you know, a sterile environment. We're creating something vibrant and, and full of life. Fallen leaves, dead stems, other detritus, they all harbor the insect life that overwinter in our garden. Keep those leaves whole, gather them on the property if you need to, if you have a brush pile, if you run out of garden beds, if you're lucky enough to have a large enough yard. Uh, those hollow stems are very important. And again, the seed heads, gotta leave those up for those songbirds and everyone else who might enjoy them through the winter months. Pay special care to those borders and edges. They're very important. Um, definitely along the sidewalk, don't let anything overhang where pedestrians are supposed to be walking. You don't want to draw negative attention to yourself and definitely keep everything, you know, edged nicely and crisp and clean in that regard at least. And again, don't cut down last year's growth until April. Generally, the rule is once the nighttime and day temperatures are above 50 degrees for about a week, it's okay to cut things back. You'll actually observe the bees flying in your garden and say to yourself, all right, now it's time I can do this. You'll, you'll get their message when they start showing up in the springtime. So again, this is one of the reasons you don't wanna be deadheading. All these seeds, nuts, berries, and fruit, that's a large part of gardening for wildlife with native plants. Um, they're very ornamental too. When you remove that stuff, when you remove those you know, interesting textured seed heads and seed pods, you're taking away a whole season's worth of ornamentation in your garden. Um, you'll especially appreciate all of that stuff with the first snowfall, especially if it's a light, you know, um, flurry that all those plants really, they hold the snow quite, quite, quite nicely and it looks very ornamental. So here's a picture of a black cat chickadee chick in my own garden in an S box. And I included this photo because I just want to show you the different 
um, the different items that make up the materials that make up the nest for this chickadee. Um, there is moss, there is arbor vitae needles from the side of my house. Uh, there is hair from probably cats, um, dogs in the neighborhood, who knows. Um, and I just wanted to show this so that you can see that all that stuff that people are constantly sweeping up and blowing up and bagging up and throwing in the garbage, wildlife uses that. Um, that's every little bit of nature doesn't get wasted. It's def it, it turns into something, whether it gets consumed by an insect or an animal and turns you know, into poop that then gets consumed by something else or breaks down into soil or you know, gets turned into a nest that then you know, hatches out more songbirds for us. So these little things that we overlook and we think of as, as creating a mess, like the leaves in the fall, they're important and they're necessary for the survival of a lot of our backyard wildlife. Preserve your soil structure. Don't rototill your beds. Um, we are not vegetable gardening and even the latest science on vegetable gardening and agriculture is really pointing to not rototilling soil either. 70% uh, of all bee species are solitary ground nesters. So when you dig in the soil and you turn it, you ruin the structure of the soil and you risk disturbing those nests and ruining them. Uh, disturbing your soil also leads to dormant weed seeds uh, erosion and compaction. Whenever you stir up your soil, um, I always recommend you cover it with something, whether you plant out more plants or you use some, some straw or other mulch to cover the soil up to prevent weed seeds from germinating. Spring maintenance and tips. Again, you don't want to cut back last year's growth. This is a little diagram for you to show how these stem nesting bees use your stems. And you know, so one question that's asked often is, you know, what happens to last year's stems if I don't cut them down? They break down. They, they'll break down slowly, and they'll turn back into soil. You know, they'll get pretty much composted by the insects and beneficial uh, the tritivores in your garden, and uh, they'll be turned back into mulch and soil. This is a photo of some stem nesting bees within my own garden. They are nesting in switchgrass. So the grasses are very important as well for pollinators. A lot of people with pollinator gardens and butterfly gardens as well, they'll only focus on the flowers because that's what's showy and that's what attracts the adults. Um, but what's important for some butterflies like skippers, they host on switchgrass. And what's important for some bees is they need the hollow stems and switchgrass and other grasses actually provide those hollow stems quite well. These are very tiny, so I should point that out too. Um, these are very tiny bees, but they actually do a lot of pollination. They'll pollinate our strawberries, they'll pollinate um, the apple trees, they'll pollinate pear trees. They do a lot of pollination, both within our native plants, but also within our, our food crops as well. If it ever becomes too much, you can always let us help. Um, we, my company does offer maintenance services. Um, if you'd like, you can actually email me. I have a document that I wrote up a while back on how to maintain a wildlife friendly yard. Uh, tools and techniques are included in that just so that you can you know, really do it yourself if you're up for it and do it properly with the right tool for the right job. Um, I'd like to thank Rewild Long Island for hosting this. I'd like to thank the members of the Long Island Native Plant Garden Group on Facebook. If you are not already a member, please do join. And I'd like to thank Long Island Native Plant Initiative. Me and Raju are on the board of directors. Um, yesterday, we celebrated the ribbon cutting ceremony for our greenhouse. So that was a big, successful day for us. And I just want to give a little shout out. Now I'll turn it over to some Q&A. Actually, let me keep sharing. So I'm going to keep sharing so that people can get my information if they need it. Um, let me see the chat. Okay, so I want to answer Barbara's question. Hi, Barbara, nice to see you. Um, or not see you, but nice to see you're here. Uh, so material I use for my pathways, I usually use um, leaves actually for my pathways in the fall because I don't have, I kind of have a prairie garden, a grassland garden. So I don't want leaf you know, cover evenly spread over my actual plants where they might um, smother some plants. So, I actually pile up all the leaves and I spread them out evenly in the pathway. And that actually smothers any weeds that might be growing in the pathway and keeps it open for me. And then, you know, me walking through it throughout the year breaks the leaves down slowly. Oh, 
Let's see. I'm going to answer Alex's question about cardinal flower. Yes. Um, so as soon as you see any plants starting to gain height, you can cut them back. You can actually wait until they get decently high and even wait till you start seeing buds. Um, just know the longer you wait and the longer, the, you know, the taller you let the plant grow, you're going to delay blooming. If you wait too long, you might delay, you know, you may actually force it not to bloom for the season. So as soon as you start to see it starting to grow, and you start seeing buds on that, you can cut it back and it'll keep it shorter. I actually experimented this year a little with grasses too. Um, a lot of times you'll read that you shouldn't touch ornamental grasses, uh, but most grasses are being grazed by some sort of wildlife in nature. Or, you know, a lot of our native grasses are actually used for even cattle ranching um, as a good forage for them. So switch grass, uh, northern river oats, you can actually cut that back as well during the growing season, if you start to see that getting too tall for you and you can kind of keep it a little shorter as well. Don't be scared either when cutting back your plants, um, especially if they've been established for you know quite a little while, um, just because they have an extensive root system, you're not going to hurt them by cutting them back. A lot of people are nervous about doing that, but you don't have to be nervous about that at all. They will bounce right back. Anthony, can you read the question out before answering it? Um, yes, just yes. For the, sorry. The recording, that's possibly better. Yes. Okay. So let's see. Shannon Kane, regarding the safety of my house, is it okay for leaves to be piled along the bed next to my house foundation? Uh, no, you kind of don't want to leave anything piled up against your house on the foundation. Um, and that goes for anything, whether it's topsoil, mulch, or, or leaves. You don't want anything too close to the house either. Um, you want to leave a little buffer zone, like I spoke about, between your your foundation and your plants, uh, just so that you can actually access your house, get behind them, and to ensure that you know wildlife isn't getting too friendly with your own home. If you so, this is from L. Scott. If you leave the seed heads slash don't cut back until spring, how are their hollow stems available for nesters? The uh, so the, the insects actually will burrow into the stems themselves or they have ovipositors. So if you've ever seen, you'll see it a lot on wasp or if you ever happen to see a cricket, female crickets have ovipositors too. Um, it's a long appendage out the back. It's kind of like a hypodermic needle and they will insert that into the stem of the plant and lay their eggs inside the hollow stem. So Dale, which native grasses would you recommend for a coastal barrier island? Switchgrass, um, little blue stem, beach grass, American beach grass. Um, even purple love grass is a nice low growing grass you can utilize as well. You can grow Indian grass, big blue stem, little blue stem. They're all good options for you to grow out in the uh, coastal areas. Carolyn, fallen leaves become matted and mushy by spring. Isn't this a problem? We have been ch chipping leaves as branch branches and putting the product back into beds. Yeah, you don't really want them to be mushy. They should be nice and fluffy. Um, so that's, you really try your best not to shred up the leaves. Um, if you know, if you, I'm all about recycling the nutrients and not throwing things away. So if you really have to, if you have branches and stuff that you're going to chip up and use as, as mulch, go for it. If you're trying to preserve um, pollinator habitat and beneficial insect habitat, try not to shred the leaves this year. Um, just lay them down and you'll see that they won't you know, break down and become mushy so fast. Another problem you may be seeing is um, invasive jumping worms break down the leaf litter very quickly. So if you see these worms in your garden that really wriggle and jump around and are kind of large and squirt juice at you, if you pick them up, you probably have Asian jumping worms. Um, a lot of us do now, and they really are destroying um, our ecosystem because they're eating the, the, the leaf litter way too quickly than what our native plants have evolved with. A lot of our native plants actually require the leaf litter to germinate those conditions to keep them moist through the, through the winter and through the spring to break down their seed coating to actually germinate. So without that, you lose those plants as well. Um, so low growing ground covers to recommend for areas need to be walked on. I like flocks, creeping flocks. It really depends on how often you plan on walking. Uh, Pennsylvania sedge and other sedges are usually the best. 
um, sunny areas, purple love grass. You can mow all of those sedges in the purple love grass as well. Um, creeping sedge, I mean, sorry, creeping phlox is also a great option that blooms in the spring. So Alex, I don't really like cedar bark mulch. Um, again, I don't think we should be, you know, chipping trees. There's no wood chipper fairy in the woods going around mulching trees down into mulch in nature. Um, so, and the cedar also has, I know a lot of people use cedar because they think it, it repels insects, which it does. Um, so that's another issue why I wouldn't want to use cedar mulch in a native plant garden. So Barbara is looking for shade plants. Um, so some nice shade plants for you would be columbine, wild geranium, woodland phlox, zigzag goldenrod, blue stem goldenrod, wood asters, like blue wood aster, white wood aster. Um, woodland sunflower is blooming right now. That's a nice addition to a woodland garden as well. Um, sweet peat, I think their mulch has a lot of um, compost and stuff in it. If, I, if I'm not mistaken, um, you know, again, the goal is to not need to purchase so much inputs for your garden, keep it low maintenance. So you don't need to be mulching constantly. And the goal also is to eventually not need mulch because your plants will be touching and be being the mulch themselves. So the goal is to, like at the picture behind me, you can see these plants are on top of each other. They're not, there's no spaces between them. That's the goal. Um, you, you don't wanna see open soil and you don't wanna see the mulch eventually. How deep is too deep? You can go two to three inches um, deep with the leaves. You don't want to pile them up too high on your woody plants, but your perennials can really, you know, they break through no problem in the springtime. It doesn't, they won't affect them. You can thin out your creeping phlox and your arrow whenever you really feel like it. Um, they actively grow through the summer months. Um, just go in there with your hands and just, you know, cut them out wherever you don't want them anymore. I'm surprised you're wanting to thin out the creeping flocks, but I understand the yarrow. The yarrow can spread to places you don't really want it to, but um, it's a great plant to have. Does anyone else have any questions? Um, yeah, no, or you can even unmute yourself if you have a question or a comment. We we'll still have a few minutes. You're welcome, Carolyn. All right. So thank you. Thank you all for joining us. And thank you again, Anthony. Um, I will have the presentation up on the address in the chat. That is, if you go to the blog on the Rewild Long Island webpage, um, you will find uh, the announcement for Anthony's talk tonight. And um, I will put the recording also on that same page. Uh, you definitely can view that. And of course, um, Anthony's address is also on some of those slides. So you can always reach out to Anthony for that handout that he so generously offered, uh, as well as uh, if you have any questions or better still, uh, you want Anthony to come over and take a look at your garden and help you out. Um, I, I, you know, a number of rewilders this season have done that and have definitely reported some very good conversations, not just getting the job done, but also building your base of knowledge which is why what I love working with Anthony is, right, he's never hesitant about answering any questions and enabling you, like sort of giving you the tools to fish for yourself, so to speak. Okay. So thank you. Thank you all very much. Have, have a wonderful night and uh, happy, happy rewilding. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you.